session. There's going to be five uh, presentations in this session, and we're going to really try to keep it to 10 minutes so we can have a little bit more discussion uh, at the end of the session. So um, I'll try to try to keep it moving. So I think the five pre presentations, they're grouped under sustainable cultures, but I think in a lot of ways they could have been uh, housed any, under any of the themes. Uh, but I think these uh, five presentations fit quite well together. Um, said, I, I work in the area of I'm an anthropologist and I've been asked to look at sustainable cultures. And um, essentially, in my, in my themes and in the, in the projects that I'm involved with and help uh, coordinate, we want to try to understand some of the, the implications of resource development and on, on culture sustainability, community well being, and so many of the issues that we're talking about uh, today uh, in the first couple of sessions. So, a lot of the work that I've been involved in, some of the presenters can't be here today, so I want to just kind of throw up a, a splattering of research results from other resident-supported projects from uh, people who haven't been here and some of the work I'm more directly involved in. And it, it, I think it follows well with some of the indicator presentations that were made earlier today. And what we're looking at is very localized indicators uh, of environmental livelihoods, uh, well-being, uh, cultural sustainability and establishing those baselines for communities to use themselves in monitoring change in relation to resource development. So I'll go through these pretty quick, uh, and then I, I'm happy to answer any, any questions you have um, uh, uh, afterwards or at the end of the session. So we're doing a lot of the traditional work, like on wildlife harvesting studies, and we're working with communities, First Nation communities, who are being impacted by oil sands development, Cracking and, and forestry for quite a, quite a long time. And this is just one example of working with Northeast Tribal Council. And they're being impacted quite heavily by resource development in their territories, but they still have managed to carve out a, a livelihood within those industrialized areas. And they're they're harvesting close to one million pounds of edible wild food a year. And this is you know 892,000 pounds of, of meat a year within these industrialized landscapes. So they're still essentially incorporating this industrialized landscape 
into a cultural landscape of, of First Nation members. We're mapping this out in terms of uh, livelihood and harvesting distribution in different areas. And again, this is, this is northern Alberta and it spills into NWP. That's just food weight that's coming off the wildlife management units. This is just uh, in terms of uh, moose harvest that these uh, First Nations are harvesting. The harvest within these communities is, is anything but uh, uh, evenly distributed among all the households. Uh, we're seeing a pattern where approximately 20% of households are harvesting 80% of all the, uh, all the food. And that's not, that's not too abnormal. We've always had this 30-70 rule. Um, not always, but basically a lot of literature points to this 30-70 rule where 30% of households harvest by 70. But we're starting to see a, a, a shift in that where you're, you're seeing a, a much smaller number of super harvesters uh, in, in communities who are going out and harvesting you know, 10, 12,000 pounds of, of food a year and distributing that through, uh, uh, through social networks. So we're, we're looking at types of households. Who, who's out there harvesting uh, and using them? different types of support networks that they have to keep them um, um, uh, producing food for the communities. Looking at social organizations of camps and cabins across the land, uh, we don't think it's enough just to do uh, you know, points on, on a map and GPS those points to understand how those, those sites on the map uh, support uh, community networks. Um, and this is just one example with this, with, with this single cabin. Um, is used regularly by eight other households in the community, 27 people, three generations, uh, and it's about 7,500 pounds of, of meat from the from the single cabin. So trying to do some scenario planning. So if this one cabin is impacted by industrial development or forestry, how does that those effects ripple throughout the community in terms of social impacts on food sharing and, and harvesting? So uh, working with um, you know these donors at least try to understand the, the links between social and ecological systems in these industrialized areas. We want to understand uh, the impacts of resource development on food sharing networks. And we're doing this work from all the way from Labrador, in this case, uh, Old Crow. So we want to look at, we're looking at food sharing within communities, but also beyond the communities, these regional food sharing networks. And this is just a picture of, or a, sociogram of food sharing in Old Crow, and you can see you know, intense food sharing within the community, but a lot of food moving outside the community. And this project started through the social economy network and was, was continuing on. And this project specifically looked at the impact of the border on food sharing between the Chin communities. But now we're looking at associated impacts of resource to, potential resource development in there, and how are Old Crow or Buntuk Wichita residents who have moved to, moved to um, uh, Whitehorse or Vancouver, how are they impacted by resource development in their traditional territory? So we're rethinking the kind of the, the scale of which community impact assessment processes should occur when you have this type of distribution uh, of food well beyond the, the localized community level. So those are projects uh, that we've been doing for the past few years and the results are being uh, shared within communities and being written up. This is one project that I uh, spent a little bit more time on. The results have just been published in the journal Food Security and um, uh, Chris, myself, Perry, and a graduate student of mine, Shay Shirley, um, um, did this research and wrote up this, this paper. And we looked at um, constraints to wildlife harvesting in a, in a number of communities across northern Canada and Alaska. Um, so we looked at uh, uh, in the Far East, the Nantucket communities, three communities in Nunavik, uh, a couple of communities uh, in, in uh, northern Alberta, and also the Yukon Flats, Alaska. And this was a, it was an op optimistic um, sample in that I was involved over the past few years in wildlife harvesting studies in, in each of these regions. And a, a common question within those, all those studies were, what are the primary constraints that are keeping uh, people from harvesting wildlife resources to the desired, uh, desired extent? And this project kind of arose out of our own frustrations with the generalizations that are being made about 
food, food insecurity in the north, or vulnerability studies, that are kind of casting a broad brush across northern communities. And we thought we needed to be a, a little bit more critical and interrogate some of the impacts a little, a little more closely. So we wanted to look at, you know, what are the what are communities, different regions, gender, age, how are all these different kind of factors experiencing uh, food insecurity differently? You know, are, are men and women experiencing differently, young and old? And that's what we, we set up to do with this, this research and paper. And I'll just, I'll just go through this, this real quick, and I'm, I'm sure you can't really see that very well in the back, but I'll, I'm happy to share the, share the paper with anybody who's interested in it. The number one barrier and strength of wildlife harvesting was, was employment. Having a, enough time to actually be out in the land and still maintain maintain the job. Um, so that was 33% of all respondents. And this was based on about 2,600 uh, households from, from that work to uh, um, the Yukon Flats. So employment was number one. And kind of the double-edged sword here was the second most uh, cited uh, constraint was having enough money to actually get out on the land and harvest. And that was, that was about 22% uh, of it. So those, those are general. It, all regions, but if you break it down um, per region, you see, you know, in Alaska it was employment, but if you go down to the Little Red River Cree in Alberta, it was actually the lack of interest uh, or knowledge to actually get out and, and harvest effectively. And you know, that, in, in, in their case, that could be attributed to residential schools and the impact on, on that generation of people who would be out on the land, not having any experience or opportunity to learn new skills. In Nunavik, it was, it was cost. The, cost, the high cost of actually getting out on, on the land. And in Nazi Abut, actually the, the single most cited constraint was uh, being physically able to get out on the land, and health, health and, uh, uh, effects, uh, not being able to get out and harvest resources effectively. Oh, I should say that even within, within um, in between, within regions, Little Red River Creek, for example, there's two communities that we, that we surveyed, Chandra Prairie and Fox Lake, and they're separated by the Peace River, just right, right across from each other. Um, the most cited um, um, barrier for uh, John Door was, was actually, uh, I want to say, employment. Or lack of knowledge, I'm sorry. Um, and, and not having. I, the point is, even within these communities, right across the community, they experience these constraints differently. One having not the money to actually go out and harvest, and the other not having the uh, uh, having to, uh, employment constraints, not having the time to go out. So even within within nations and within regions, these communities are experiencing these constraints very differently. So again, uh, cautioning against these gross generalizations about what's keeping people. The next is just uh, uh, we want to look at age and, and gender differences, and, and naturally you, you look at like the, the impacts of school and, and, and attendance in, in school or having school aged children, and the folks between 20 and uh, 39, that, that was a, a big constraint for them actually being able to get out of the land. For people over 60, that just wasn't a constraint anymore, and they, that, that wasn't keeping them from harvesting. But when you look at poor health, um, it, it was a big, big limitation, not so for the people who were between 20 and 39. Some of the other interesting things that we, you know, um, we found was the lack of knowledge, the differences between men and women between the ages of uh, 20, uh, or between the ages of 20 and 39. Uh, men, for example, feel that they, they had more knowledge to actually harvest, uh, women not having the necessary interest to, to do so within that age group. Um, both men and women in total, uh, employment was a big constraint uh, for them. 38% uh, of men saying employment was a, a barrier, 35% of women. Yet only uh, two men said that childcare was a constraint to them being out on the land, where, where 40 women or 9% of the total sample said childcare was, was a barrier uh, to actually getting out and, and harvesting. So there's there's a, a number of things within within the data that we that we talk about uh, within the paper. And, uh, the, the final results. Uh,
So in, in the paper, and I know the point of this, this workshop is actually, let's, let's move these results into uh, some policy recommendations. And I think that's what we need to, over the next couple of years in Resda, really need to concentrate on taking it from the academic journals and, and, and publications to actually, you know, trying to create some informed policy on these issues. And one of the things that, from this, this paper, um, and all the other studies that we've been doing, uh, that I've been involved with, is it's become very clear that we have to do a better job at normalizing subsistence in the world. Um, not treating it as a lower rung of economic or social development, waiting for wage employment to come in. Um, based on the results of the harvest studies and, and uh, participation in, in, in harvesting, subsistence harvesting continues to be a viable form of economic production in these communities. And we need to find ways and develop policies that support those forms of production equitably along with industrial development and other forms of public employment. And in, in the paper, we talk about different uh, uh, recommendations for actually supporting harvesting and meeting this heterogeneity in, in, in constraints. And we talk about work location and job training programs, which is actually met, uh, mentioned last night, um, which I, I think is uh, would be a useful uh, approach. Hunter support programs, while they're introduced and implemented in some regions of the North, not so, like in cases of the Yukon or the Nassau group. Uh, flexible school schedules for children to be out on the land with, with their parents during uh, important seasons of the year. And youth elder lamp-based knowledge experience. All these things are happening in different places, but they're ad hoc. And what I think if we're going to support the subsistence production in the North, we need to have a more uniform and, and um, consistent approach across across the north to support uh, wildlife harvesting, along with other forms of economic production. So that's some of the work that uh, I've been involved in, and, and others under the Sustainable Cultures uh, uh, group. And we're going to hear four other papers now that also have been organized under that theme. many people, not just myself, so I just wanted to give a nod um, to Sheena, who's actually in the room, if you want to give a wave. Is she here? Oh, well, maybe she's not in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Deb Simmons, um, Emily Cameron, and Ron. And so we were tasked with looking at gender relations in the growth development. So that's a pretty difficult task to do, um, because it's always a question of what does that actually mean. And previous research that looked at gender in growth development really focused on individualized impacts, sometimes looking at impacts on families, but um, it often looked at women as victims of resource development, um, or kind of how, how was resource development negatively affecting women, and focusing on negative social outcomes. And one of the results of this is that it has this kind of victimizing effect, and, um, and, and, and it can also kind of narrow the scope of what women actually think is important in the North. And so we wanted to get away from that. And so um, in, our initial, our, in our initial um, gap analysis, where we looked at types of research that were lacking in terms of gender and resource development, and some of the um, absences we saw were that um, there weren't many studies looking at gender dimensions of institutions. There also wasn't a lot of research that looked at 
um, women's leadership and strategic perspectives vis-a-vis -vis, um, resource development. We really wanted to address that. And also looking at how the increasing influence of resource extraction in communities is influencing gender roles and relations um, more broadly than impacts on women. Now this last question we weren't able to tackle as fully because this is kind of an initial part um, project and I think that that would take um, a lot of further research to get out of that. So our research objectives that we set out with, and keep in mind that these were flexible as well because uh, particularly with our qualitative research we tried to let women also define some of the research questions. The first was to look at how decision making institutions or processes governing participation in um, more than resource extraction were gendered. And here we conducted an environmental um, scan of environmental assessments. The second was to look at how Northern Indigenous women understood relationships between increased resource development and gender relations. And the third was to look at how Northern Indigenous women um, saw policy interventions. So what did they think was important in terms of improving the, um, uh, the benefits that communities could get from resource development? So as I mentioned, environmental scan of, of, of environmental assessments in of three projects in different regions. And, um, and then we also conduct focus groups in Salita and in Maine and um, with women. And then the third phase of the project that we're going to look at is trying to communicate those results by bringing women into a conversation with one another across the region. And then we're hoping that will happen. So for the environmental scan, the leader on that was actually Sheena Kennedy, and, um, and with under the, um, the, the mentorship of um, Emily Cameron. And here, what was found was that um, they looked at how gender was looked at within environmental impact statements. And so, really, within environmental impact statements, what they found is that women were the, the, the examination of gender was often constrained to what are the negative impacts of um, resource development on women, and women were characterized as passive subjects. There was also an overemphasis on employment in resource industries, um, and this type of employment is heavily masculinized, so that served to kind of underrepresent the economic activity of women in communities. Uh, and there was a focus, even when there was a focus on subsistence activities, it was often a focus on men's So, uh, women's participation in indigenous knowledge production as well as the social economy were less, uh, were given less attention in that statements. So, what were women's interventions? Now, these varied across the regions depending on the institutional structures and um, on the women who actually participated. There were six women's organizations who made submissions at different stages uh, for the Voices Bay project, but not so much in the other regions, but what we looked at is, um, was interventions from both women's groups and from individual women. And the interventions of women really drew attention first um, to the negative outcomes of the shift to greater reliance on resource extraction for families and communities, but also they really encouraged a broader scope of analysis so that environmental assessments should adopt broader methods and address other aspects of and focus less on resource-based um, resource employment. Now, as far as the focus groups in the active groups, these were conducted um, in combination with Charlotte Walfrey, Johanna Tupolina, and John Sebastian. And they were also in partnership with the Minnesota government and the Central Women's Women's Association. And these were day-long conversations day-long conversations with women um, that were fairly open-ended. So we began with a smaller group of women to try to talk about some of the questions that we would ask and then we would go with these kind of larger groups. We had representation from women from all of the communities on the coast, a variety of ages and um, people who were in Voices Bay families and people who were community members and were involved in different types of economic activities. Some of the observations that came out of these groups were similar to things that we've seen in previous research. Um, what women wanted to talk about was um, things that they observed in their community were rising wealth amongst continued poverty. 
So um, there was a really a strong sense of injustice that there'd be so much wealth generated from the mine, but that there was continued poverty and food insecurity. And that was, there was actually some anger in the room from people who um, had expressed anger and frustration. And then um, another general observation was, was that there was an increasing reliance on cash transactions and sharing in the community. Another thing that um, women really wanted to talk about was unequal access to mining opportunities. And this was framed primarily in terms of employment. Um, so they perceived employment to be the predominant way that people were benefiting from the mining in their communities. And that's probably why this kind of framed the discussions. And, and they perceived people who um, had employment at the mine as benefiting both from wages and from the non wage benefits that mining employment provided. And this included access to fresh food, um, uh, money to buy things, uh, buy materials to um, better engage in land-based activities. Um, also, access to eviction supports was mentioned as something that employees have access to that other people don't. There is also a strong dissatisfaction with the, the low number of people living in the coastal communities, having that to who um, are working at the mine. That there were 71 people amongst all the coastal communities working at the mine out of approximately 250 communities. Um, most people were living in the larger regional centers, and they talked about people when they got jobs at the mine would often move to the larger centers. So there was just a sense of isolation in the communities, lack of contact with the mine, um, and, and that they also had a lot of barriers to be able to apply for employment. One of the things that's in the background of this is that when Valet bought out Voices Bay Nickel, Valley Central centralized a lot of the HR, um, the HR to Toronto, and everything is done online now. And so there are some things that are going on with kind of I think this internationalization of mining capital that is also influencing uh, the ability of communities to actually access even um, employment. Prior to that time, there was actually an office. These are some quotes, uh, depending on time, I'll be going about that time, I'll just give you one minute. <laughs> so some of the key issues, I, I think some of the, the things I've learned from the Nazi research is also, uh, were also research related. Um, so, uh, uh, so in the context of rapid social change, research processes also need to acknowledge and accommodate the feelings of being unsettled as part of the research. Um, so, to get to some of these higher level questions, you probably need um, more research than simply a few quotes, groups, right? Because you need to process through that anger and sense of injustice. Also, that the focus group provide a nice venue to be able to collaboratively um, identify research questions. So, I think at the end of this, we came up with some ideas for future research questions that um, could be talked about. There were a lot of whether people who were working at the mine actually had a better off or not. This is like a trade-off, whether, whether it actually truly was a good thing or not. Um, and also the project, um, the other thing I remember was that in some of the communities, in, in, in the United States, there had already been final work, and there is that uh, in women's organization, so we were able to crystallize in some of the, some of the um, input or things that they had been talking about already. So there were recommendations, and um, the one felt very strongly that I communicate those both to their own government, but also in a wider, broader forum. And one is the moving barriers to employment. They wanted to have someone hired in their community who they could access to help people with the applications. Um, they wanted to increase a social support to families and communities. They wanted stronger IPAs. They wanted an office person um, so that when they felt like the IPA was not being followed, that there was something they could go to. They also, it wasn't, well, women also had mixed per perceptions about the future research development. Most people said that they would be supportive of future research development so long as the benefits were greater and the costs were less than what they were experiencing in the first day. Okay, the Satya region um, settlement area. So, 
in here, um, there were some focus groups initially with women, as well as follow-up interviews with individuals. Now, we don't have the results from those interviews yet, but those interviews explored some sensitive topics that it's not possible to talk about focus groups such as violence against women. And so those are the issues that will come up in the focus group environment. Um, and what came out of the focus groups in this example, um, or in this region, were really that while women were talking about their own experiences, what their concerns were were for future generations. So um, they really wanted to make sure that the cross-generational impacts of the negative experiences that they had felt were mitigated. Um, so they're actually, as a result of those focus groups that kind of crystallized conversations that people had previously been having in the community, there actually have already been changes. Um, they've created a space for youth their own self-organized activities. Um, since this time, a SATU network across five communities has been created. And those spaces, um, they also encourage cross-gender discussions in the spaces. So as far as overall recommendations from this, all of these different pieces, um, one is that the scope of environmental assessment and programming to address the impacts of research development all economic activities, social, traditional, and social economies, and all generations, women and men. Second, that attention to gender in women communities needs to bridge and address challenges to maintain um, healthy economies that include research development and traditional economies. And last, that gender impacts um, involve men as well as women, youth as well as older women, and that focus groups are somewhat limited. Staples and I am currently a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo but today I'm going to be talking about uh, my master's work that I did with Dr. David Natcher um, and with the support of RESDA um, and I'd really like to thank RESDA for putting this together in particular about Walker who once upon a time I was her research assistant many many years ago and I helped put together the very first RESDA workshop so I know very well how much work these things are to put together and Val six years later is still doing an amazing job. <laughs> um, so thank you to her. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, gender decision making and natural resource co-management specifically in the Yukon. Um, Suzanne's uh, presentation was actually a really nice opener for this one because um, some of the gaps she mentioned uh, fit really well with what I'm going to be talking about. You know, she was talking about the gender dimensions of institutions and uh, the way that decision making processes are gendered and that's really what um, I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I think most of you know where the Yukon is, so you can probably skip through that. <laughs> Uh, so just as kind of a starting point, um, the definition of co-management that we took, um, obviously it's a fairly broad term, has been implemented in a number of different ways across Canada, um, but the, we defined it as, the, or the definition that we used was that um, it's a spectrum of institutional arrangements um, in which uh, both users and government are involved. Um, in the Yukon, as well as across the North, co-management boards um, have been a really important outcome of the land claims process. Um, they've been a really important part of um, trying to bring a, a grassroots uh, community-based voice to the natural resource management process, as well as to other factors like um, uh, protecting uh, indigenous rights to hunting, trapping, and fishing. 
Um, in the Yukon, these boards operate at a number of different levels. Um, so you have community-based boards, like renewable resource councils, you have regional boards, and then you have cross-jurisdictional boards as well. Um, so the starting point for my research was really an inventory um, that was done by uh, my supervisor, Dave Natcher, and he took an inventory of the um, management boards across the north and looked at um, the, the number of men and women on these boards. Um, so the Yukon actually had the highest um, representation of women, um, and this was done uh, in 2012, so I, this is modified slightly from that work. Um, but it was around 20% of the um, people on those boards were women. Um, and so that was really the starting point for this work. We wanted to know, um, you know does, this, does this make a difference in terms of uh, the decision-making processes on these boards? And does this have an, uh, an effect on the experiences of the women who are, are on these institutions? Um, and one thing I want to point out uh, at, you know, from the get-go is that this is only one way that decisions are made um, about natural resources. Um, and so even though women are not necessarily directly represented um, within these boards, it doesn't mean that they aren't very active in other ways. Um, and certainly there's been a lot of research elsewhere that has demonstrated the informal participation um, and informal influence of women on decision-making processes. But for the, the, the purposes of this work, we're focusing specifically on some of those formal decision-making um, structures of co-management boards. Um, so I looked at specifically at wildlife management boards in the Yukon um, at a number of different levels. We did a, a very unsuccessful written survey um, and a slightly more successful uh, semi-structured interviews with around 35 people. Um, we tried to capture a range of different experiences we talked to mostly women, but also men, um, board members, staff members, past and present, um, and really just tried to capture that diversity of experiences. Um, and I think that was really captured in our findings. And again, one thing I want to say from the get-go is that there were a diversity of experiences. There is no one experience with gender on co-management. Um, and so, while well, I'm going to be talking about some broad themes, um, they don't, these themes don't necessarily speak to every single person's experience. So one of the things that came out of this work was um, when we were talking to, to, to people, we didn't want to assume that um, gender or that, um, that the representation of women was in fact relevant to um, co-management boards, but that really became a theme is that um, it, you know, it really, all of the people that we talked to almost unanimously said that um, it was important to have women represented on co-management boards. But they often gave different reasons for why this, um, why their representation was important. And these kind of tended to fall into three different categories. Um, and it's interesting because each of these categories really highlights a different aspect of that relationship between gender um, and decision making in co-management. So I'm just going to run through those quickly. Um, the first reason that people gave was that women's representation is important beca is because diversity in general is important. Um, so gender is one aspect of diversity. Um, another aspect that Suzanne alluded to was, is age. You know, people were very concerned about the lack of youth representation on co-management boards. Um, so I think this quote kind of captures, captures that, the implications of diversity nicely. She says, um, I'm surrounded by men with gray hair. You know, it's the same thing over and over again. And then, then you have this homogenous approach to things. So uh, you know, she's really highlighting that in order to manage natural resources effectively, um, you have to have a range of interests and perspectives at the table. Uh, the second uh, response that people gave was around um, the representation of women and um, the positive influence that they had on the decision-making process. So they said that um, the women on, having women on co-management boards meant there was a more holistic approach to decision-making. Um, so that meant, you know, uh, different perspectives were represented, uh, there was um, a more complex discussion, more likely to bash around different ideas. And that um, in addition to that, women were also more likely to contribute to a more positive institutional culture. Um, so that meant um, more civil and respectful discussions, um, improved communication, um, and improved um, or uh, personal relations, the development of personal relationships. And then the third response um, that I think is probably the most interesting to me is that 
uh, women bring a, a unique set of perspectives, knowledge, and experiences to the table based on their roles in the community and on the land. Um, so in, uh, in particular, the, their experiences on the land was especially, especially relevant. Um, just in general to uh, both men and women, the having experiences on the land was a really important part of being a co-management board member. It meant that you had um, you had knowledge of the land on, on first-hand experiences, but it also meant you had credibility um, with your other board members. Um, just in general, the people that um, I, was talk I was talking to fell into um, a fairly gendered division of labor in terms of the activities that they participated in on the land. That's by no means a hard and fast rule, um, but in general, men were more involved in the hunting, trapping, and fishing side of things, whereas women were more involved in berry picking, meat processing, fish camps, and that sort of thing. So the majority of the women that I talked to were um, very involved in activities on the land, and that really shaped their perspectives um, and their experiences that they brought to the table. So this woman was talking about fish camp in particular, um, and the, the role that it played in, um, in, in the type of knowledge that she brought to the table. So even though she wasn't directly involved in, um, in um, harvesting, she was still very much involved in harvesting activities. Um, and that was really important for her. Um, uh, another woman was talking about um, the, her role in um, activities on the land that involved berry patches, roots, and medicinal plants. And again, not um, directly in uh, hunting, trapping, and fishing, but still very important. And these, uh, this type of knowledge was extremely important in terms of the, the broad ecosystem and, um, and bringing the perspective of um, uh, of not just of fish and wildlife, but also of ecosystem as a whole. Um, so that really brought us to question, you know, whether women's knowledge of the land was being effectively engaged in decision-making processes on co-management boards. And um, the answer to that was um, a, a mixed. Um, some women felt that their experiences were very valued. Other women felt that their um, activities typically undertaken by men, so the hunting, trapping, and fishing side of <coughs> things, were really the focus of co-management boards. And even then, some women, women were fine with that, um, whereas other women felt that this was really to, it really narrowed the, um, the, the, the type of knowledge that was brought to the table. Um, so this was actually a comment made by one of the men that I talked to who was just observing the difference between um, the types of knowledge that were brought to the table and really the relevance of, he's talking about gathering in particular, but the relevance of that to um, the mandate of co-management boards. You know, these boards are mandated with um, not just protecting wildlife, um, but also with protection of broader ecosystems, with representing voices of the community, with culture. They have a very broad mandate, and so, um, you know, when they narrow the scope of, um, of knowledge that's brought to the table, they really risk, run the risk of narrowing the scope of the decisions that they make. And so while certainly um, valid to focus on hunting, trapping, and fishing, um, it shouldn't be at the expense of other types of knowledge. Um, the other thing that we talked to people about was um, their... Um, Community participation in the mining sector we look through the lens of employment in this project. So uh, we wanted to understand how people cope with flying flout work. And for those who are not familiar, flying flout is just the terminology uh, or uh, um, another word for rotational shift work, which implies living kind of, for instance, two weeks in a camp, being away from your family, but then being uh, off shift for another two weeks. So it's a rotational shift work where you are uh, on and off from home and where you live in a, in a rather small uh, commuter camp for uh, a certain period and which has, uh, it, it's confined, you're very close to your fellow workers and there are a lot of social issues involved in that. And I would like to present you then the, the table of contents where you can see what issues are involved with fly and fly out work. So as I told you already, what is the, the, the aim of the Mobility Workers Guide? It's really to transmit uh, the knowledge how to cope with flying, fly out work and with living in camps, with being away from families, with having a lot of money suddenly and being young single male or being a woman 
uh, a young woman in a male environment in the camp and so on. So these issues are reported by the experienced workers and should help on the long run through this uh, mobility workers guide uh, those uh, those young people who are interested becoming workforce in this sector but do not have a clue and our research showed that so many people uh, living in mining areas actually have not been at mining sites because they are remote they are confined places so uh, they are uh, hardly have any experience or idea what does it mean to enter as workforce the mining sector. So uh, the table of contents is for example we are uh, talking about joining a mobile work life in mining. So how can I uh, learn about jobs and what is my work attitude and people told these stories. Then we have a chapter on training and career development which is really important. Uh, and and a, a really hot topic in a sector that is so unsustainable in terms of career development. You have the boom and bust cycles and so boom and bust is also a topic and a big topic is how I can maintain a professional career in a sector that is so volatile. And uh, then we have the issue of, for instance, of jealousy, breakups, private relationships. So these topics come up a lot then how can I stay in touch with my family or my friends or with my community? And the big thing is also living off the land. How can I manage the interaction between uh, working for a mine, doing a wage work in a mine that potentially and actually harms, of course, or impacts the environment that is so essential for me as a First Nation person doing their subsistence uh, activities. So this was a big issue too. And um, just to, to give you a little idea how the, the language of the, of, of, of the, work, uh, of the workers' guide uh, looks like, I, I will read out a little bit of this story, uh, of the storybook related to mining and living off the land. So just a little section of that. So Jessica's husband, Mike, works in a shift, on the shift thrust of two weeks in and two weeks off. Mike explains, for me working in the mine is good, you know. The hunting gear, the fuel, the vehicles and the boat are expensive. A lot has changed compared to the old days, so we don't have any dog teams anymore and so on. It is hard for others who do not have a well-paying job to afford to go out on the land. A critical point is having time for traditional activities in the season when animals are around or fish is going up the river. Some companies acknowledge these cultural needs for First Nation peoples. Agreements between the companies and First Nation groups are called impact benefit agreements or comprehensive benefit agreements. First Nation workers are sometimes entitled to take longer leaves during the hunting season in order to harvest for their families and communities during peak animal migration. Tanya, a human resources person of a mid-sized mine, explains, today companies want to employ the locals. Therefore, we have to adjust to the local cultural needs of our workers. If they give us a note in advance, we can manage to find a cross shift and they can take longer leaves than these two weeks. So Yvonne and Corka in the race. Two weeks is usually enough to get a moose or a sheep or to go out on the fish camp. Sometimes you get the moose in a day or two, but sometimes it takes longer. However, it does not always work out like that. Some mining companies are not sensitive towards the cultural needs of their employees. Since it is such an important part of Aboriginal cultural identities and livelihoods to harvest subsistence foods, Sometimes local workers narrate, when the company is not sensitive to these specifics, that they feel forced to quit the job during hunting season. This in turn leads to unemployment and other potential troubles. It also upsets the relationship between the community and the company it is collaborating with. In general, Mike enjoys his two weeks off. He can take his rifle and stay out on the land for a couple of days to hunt 
or to cut firewood. He also takes his kids out to the fish camp or on a hunting trip and telling us, I prefer the two, uh, uh, I prefer the two weeks in, two weeks off uh, to a nine to five job because I'm much more flexible. The moves don't come around only on the weekends, so you need time, a lot of time in the bush. So and this is the style how the mobile workers guide is written and we have original quotes and so on. And what we try is not to give a guidebook like a do's and don'ts and we really want to give the voice to the elders in the mining sector, so to speak. So another result uh, was, uh, which I really want to highlight, uh, uh, that people are really concerned about the environment and there is a strong awareness among the workforce and the community members about the benefits and negative impacts. So uh, it is a really a concern that environmental issues are still not addressed in appropriate way. And this is really a conflicting situation in the Yukon since the industrial sector says we have so strict regulations in the Yukon that we are not any more attractive for foreign investors. So and another outcome was that the community is really eager to participate in this community and information <coughs> gatherings. So they are interested in what is going on in the IBA no negotiation <coughs> processes and so on. And they are interested in coming to, to, uh, to the meetings uh, held by, by the mining companies. So and, uh, what I also wanted to raise, so it's really so essential in, in, in so many talks, this quote comes up, we also want to mine in hundreds of years and let's keep the deposits for the next generations. So do not mine in a greedy way for quick revenues. So along these lines, people talked a lot. So and how uh, coming back to employment, uh, there were two strategies how to have a sustainable career in mining and Actually, it is mobility, so fly in, fly out all over Canada. Some people even fly abroad to South America, but this is really an exception, but they are there. So uh, if the, uh, the, the bus comes back, as it happens regularly, uh, people who are trained only in professions related to the mining sectors really have to fly in, fly out elsewhere. The other thing is that uh, strategy that was narrated and, and uh, uh, a lot was to diversify the skills. So people should not have only one trade, but a second trade, or being underground miner and at the same time electrician, or just to really diversify your portfolio. So um, there was one saying, oh, miners are really handy people, so you can get a job everywhere, but you have to be aware that uh, you cannot constantly make good money and so save the money because also your back gets sore and your health gets damaged by the time. So uh, the mining sector is considered as not sustainable in terms of career. So sustainability is really a matter of personal flexibility. Um, so. Uh, my contact lenses do not work, so it's really, <laughs> it's so far away, <laughs> and I'm so old. <laughs> so, uh, the policy recommendations are really bring out information to the workforce, to the new one, to the old workforce, because also the, el uh, the elder uh, workforce is, is struggling sometimes with social issues but bring out the information to schools, bring information about the way of life, of living in camps, living a separate life from your families. Bring that into my training courses, even if it's a mechanic course. Have one or two sessions about uh, what is life as, as, uh, as a worker in the mining sector about. So, and then another outcome was develop uh, community plans uh, uh, that, that, that uh, consider complementary economy or economies. It's not an alternative to mining because people are generally pro-mining, 
but they need complementary sectors. They talk about agriculture a lot, for instance, and, and social business in agriculture and so on. And then what's really important is provide training programs to the, uh, to the very vulnerable target groups among the mine workforce. Like this is First Nation employees and it's women. They are very often only in entry level jobs and this creates of course a, a, a big inequality. And the future research, do we have one more minute? Yeah, one more, okay. Future research is what we came across was people said, hey, you're collecting your data and you, you really found out lots of things about our life and please try to, to transmit that in, 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 in trainings. And so our idea was under the slogan, turning research into, into knowledge uh, to transfer not only our research results into curricula and training curricula, but also probably that on the long run or midterm, the various rest approach could collaborate and collect the lessons learned in order to provide a training curriculum that is targeted in particular to mining so people, those who are interacting between companies and the communities, uh, and also young decision makers or the younger generation that will become in near future decision makers because a lot of these technicalities, uh, there, uh, be it the IBAs, be it ways of negotiations, be it employment strategies, be it um, complementary community development. So a lot of these technical issues uh, are known by the experienced leaders in the community but less so by the younger generation. Thank you. Thank you. Right, our last presentation this session is from uh, Josh Gladstone from Carleton University. I, I am. Okay. Um, anybody else? Um, hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Josh Gladstone. I'm a student at Carleton University. Uh, I've been studying harvester support programs, uh, in particularly in Nunavut, as they emerged in the the 70s, and how they're working today. Uh, in, in Nunavut and in particular two communities, uh, Iqaluit and Cambridge Bay. So I'm coming to the end of my dissertation and, uh, and I'm here to sort of test out an argument with you. Um, it's it's um, one that builds on, I guess, some of the ideas that Frances Abel, who's also my supervisor, mentioned yesterday in her keynote, which is that um, we need, a, we need to rethink what northern development looks like uh, in today's age. And Francis gave us some ideas for, for why that might be and, and what might need to happen. I'd like to build on that by suggesting that we need to uh, think about how social policy might be an important facet of sustainable development in the Arctic. So, uh, what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes, 12 minutes, I hope I have that much time, um, I'd like to run through my argument with you and, uh, and then ask for your, your feedback at the end. Uh, back in 1977, just after the Berger inquiry, Mel Watkins put forward a model of northern development in which comprehensive land claims agreements would become the solution to the exploitation of indigenous peoples by non-renewable resource development. This concept was, was really straightforward. It seemed straightforward anyway at the time. Comprehensive land claims agreements would create the institutional framework through which indigenous peoples 
would exert control over the non-renewable resource industry, capturing surplus, so rents or profits, and redirecting that surplus towards the harvesting economy. In this way, mining and oil gas um, extraction might serve the, the public interest. So he saw harvesting, in particular at that time, subsistence harvesting, commercial, also commercial harvesting, as being an important facet of the public interest. His concept of alternative development suggests that the goal of sustainable development, development in the Arctic could be achieved by maximizing the economic benefits to the region from mining and oil and gas development. So you capture the rents, you put them in towards the harvesting economy. I think that history has begun to show that this approach will not be sufficient to support harvesters um, or their families. Um, if they are going to avoid poverty and the destructive effects of markets on their way of life, if they choose to continue harvesting. So I'm not going to try and convince you of the reasons why that might be, but I'd, I'd just like to mention a couple. One is population growth. We see more and we see high rates of population growth, more and more people who may turn to harvesting as an activity that they want to do to sustain themselves and their families. Um, and also that I don't believe that beneficiary organizations through land claims will ever be resourced uh, through comprehensive land claims agreements alone to secure the general welfare of harvesters. And uh, you can see that today in Nunavut anyway, where harvester support programs uh, have ceased to be funded through the trust fund that was set up because the fund was invested in the market and the market took a hit. And uh, now harvesters don't have a program. So I'd like to suggest that the clearest path to sustainable, sustainability in Arctic development might be to enshrine a set of social rights vis-a-vis -vis harvesting and enact them through strong and enduring fiscal relationships between indigenous peoples in the state. So this happened in, in Quebec in 1975 through their comprehensive land claims agreement, the James Bay Northern Quebec Agreement. The state took on the role of supporting harvesting. And um, the extent to which that agreement is working isn't, isn't something that I'm studying right now. But we do know that uh, the returns to harvesters from, from the state, from general revenue of the state, has been consistent uh, and growing because it's indexed since the 1970s. In Nunavut, that's not the case. Uh, Inuit couldn't negotiate a, what you might call a social program into their agreement. It was in 93, which was 20 years later, and governments weren't embedding social programs into harvesters, into comprehensive land claims agreements at the time. So Nunavut got a different program. They got one that uh, was invested in the market. It was uh, to the tune of 30 million, I believe, through 15 million from the government and 15 million from uh, TFN at the time. So um, what I'd like to do is reconceptualize harvester support as a social policy regime. and that um, made up of a network of social programs and policies aimed at weakening the market dependence of Inuit harvesters, uh, Inuit workers, harvesters, and social assistance recipients. So what I'm, essentially what I'm suggesting is a decommodification strategy in line with what welfare states typically do, uh, which is to support people and minimize risk uh, in their participation in market activities. So labor markets, for instance. So the policies emerged in the 70s in parts of Inuit Nunagat where they, they take the basic form of producer support programs uh, in which either the state or Inuit organizations provide subsidies to Inuit harvesters who are conceived as independent producers in the mixed economy. So in this way, they could be mistaken for economic programs oriented towards small commodity producers. That's how they are set up in Nunavut. Uh, but in the work that I've done, uh, and with the people that I've spoken to up north, this isn't the way that those people, those Inuit I've spoken with, understand these programs. They don't see each other as commodity producers. Um, through conversations with, with these people, it seems clear to me that um, Inuit continue to see their rights and responsibilities to each other reflecting their social position, their position in the social economy. So the, the reciprocal relationships that exist among family members, members of the community that are outside of the market. 
this is why this is why selling, say, caribou and Nunavut has become such an issue. Um, we can talk about that at the end if you'd like. Um, so, under capitalism, as markets become hegemonic, individuals are compelled to sell their labor power in order to survive. Inuit began to experience these forces in the in during the fur trade, but their transformative power wasn't experienced until the 40s and 50s, um, as families resettled in communities and began to uh, become increasingly dependent on cash. So harvesting continued, but access to the land became increasingly difficult and expensive. Harvesting itself became dependent on cash inputs from wages and our government social transfers. Right? Um, so the harvester support programs responded to these changes. Different proposals were put forward over the years, but the one in Nunavut, in terms of, in terms of the social rights embedded in these programs, um, it was integrated with a means-tested social program like income support. Um, and today it resembles a safety net of last resort. So if you're a harvester and you need uh, equipment, you have to go and ask, you have to apply to this program, demonstrate your need, and hopefully there will be enough equipment in the program, a skidoo or an ATV, that you might receive it. Um, like social assistance, benefits are low, they're punishing, and they're associated with social stigma. So added to that is this issue of the fact that the, the, fun, the program is funded through a market mechanism and uh, if Inuit are counting on access to this program and the program goes bust because the market collapses, they go without a program. So any social rights that might be embedded in this program are undermined if the markets collapse. So Inuit are facing extremely uncertain times in their, in the, in, in their, in their subsistence economy uh, in relation to the programs that exist for harvester support. Now there are other programs that exist, um, like in the contract, in the IIBAs that um, Gertie was talking about. Um, there are collective agreements for workers. Um, there's a disaster compensation program. There are all kinds, there's a sort of a network of programs, but I'm really gonna be talking mostly about, about these harvester support programs. Um, so, what I'd like to do, I guess, in the next five minutes is talk about specifically what some of the social rights might be that people experience uh, in relation to these programs, but in connection with their position in the economy. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the position of, say, someone who's employed with the government, really good job, um, that person might have a contract and is likely to have a contract that allows them a couple of days a week uh, or a couple of days a year to go and, and harvest at very short notice. I also know that some people who work in the private sector that don't have a contract like that, um, I've heard firsthand stories of people who have been fired for leaving their job in order to go and harvest because they had to give short notice to do it uh, on receipt of attack. So you can see how the, the kinds of rights that you might experience as a worker in the economy uh, might differ, say, from someone who might not be a worker, might be receiving income support. So if you look at the situation for people on income support who might be looking to harvest, you can imagine what that situation might be. And I'll, I'd like to, to talk about that briefly. Um, so, in 2014, there were over 4,300 income support cases in Nunavut in a population of 3,600 people. Income support offers basic and extended benefits to individuals quali qualifying as persons in need. Basic benefits include food allowance, shelter, housing, utilities, and fuel. These are the things that you can get money for. Extended benefits cover, among other things, clothing, furniture, equipment, education, tuition, and ground transportation. There's no category specifically for harvesting in the social assistance benefits. Um, so neither capital, capital equipment, nor operations and maintenance, the, like the, the repairs that might need to be done or the, the gas that you might need in order to go harvesting, those aren't included as something that you get money directly for. Instead, when uh, someone who's on social assistance needs gas to go harvesting, it can be taken out of the, the food budget. 
So someone on social assistance needs to choose between putting food on the table from the grocery store or perhaps going harvesting and maybe not bringing food in. It's a very difficult situation. Um, and it's very uncertain. So my argument is, after looking at the relationships that exist between people and, and these different institutions, the pieces of the welfare state that exist up north, um, I, I would argue that harvester support programs in Nunavut anyway, do little beyond helping Inuit who demonstrate need to purchase capital equipment. Um, the program was never resourced to provide all harvesters with all of the equipment they need all the time, nor has it ever provided a stipend that would help families who choose harvesting as their primary economic, economic activity to survive without forcing them to find other ways of obtaining cash to meet their basic needs or more. So the program, like, uh, like our social safety net in Canada, orients people into the labor market. And if you're not participating in the labor market, your benefits are very low. And people, um, people that I spoke with see stigma attached to receiving those benefits. Um, that, that creates a lot of conflict in, in communities. And some of that conflict uh, came out in the, the conversations that I have with people. Um, so I'd like to suggest that there are uh, there are ways that we could rethink the social safety net in the north that would account for the fact that people experience the hardships of harvesting in different ways depending on their class position in society. And that it could be done in ways that promote some form of solidarity among harvesters rather than feelings of resentment when some people get equipment and some people don't, which, is, which is, happens all the time. And I think the way to do that is to think through very carefully um, what, uh, sort of use examples from other parts of the world, uh, including in our own backyard. Quebec has a, has a program, two programs, one for the Cree, one for Inuit, that do things a little bit differently and provide sustainable support through the state to uh, support harvesters. I also think uh, three more points terms of sort of policy ideas. Um, the, these programs need to provide, they need to provide benefits to all Inuit. They can't just be directed, I think, towards one group. Uh, that's based on the conversations that I've had and some of the, the difficulties that people see in um, the way that the, the structure um, Second, that, orga that organizing around the class position so issues for white collar workers, issues for say uh, rotational workers, for blue collar workers, and uh, people who have decided to participate solely in the harvesting economy. All of those, the issues for all of those people in those positions need to be accounted for. And finally, the system needs to be under local control. So if the money's coming from the state, there has to be some way of structuring a fiscal relationship between the government and perhaps Inuit organizations or beneficiary organizations that would allow the money to come in and be distributed in ways that are under indigenous control and not state control. And I think that might, that might um, deal with some of the issues that might come up around uh, uh, the, the political disempowerment that could happen if, if these were simply state, state programs directed from the state. And I also think that this is a political project. Um, taking some control of the state to substantively address the social rights of harvesters. Uh, and I'd like, to, I'd like to leave it there. Thanks, Josh. I'm told we have eight minutes for questions. So I have <laughs> Yeah. Um, both comment and question. I was struck by how many of the panelists talked about harvesting or subsist uh, subsistence activities and how important it is and the point you made about the importance of normalizing that activity, right? Um, I, it certainly was our experience with them or that how much women talked about berry picking. And it took me a long time to really understand how important that was, which is I think my lack of knowledge about the North, but also I think 
think that's sort of colonial perspective, assumptions and worldview. So I think it's important that we acknowledge that that root of it as well and work at it on that level. Um, the question I had was for you, David, I really appreciated your disaggregation by gender of the issues. Um, and I noticed though one of the policy, a big issue for women was the lack of childcare to get out and, and do their activities on the land. Um, but it didn't make your policy recommendations. I wondered, was there a particular reason for that or just we took the top three or something? Pretty much took the top three. Yeah, I, we, we talked more about that uh, in, in the paper. And but also, it was like some of the recommendations uh, that Josh made, local control of the, these, these programs and, and designing support mechanisms locally that make, make sense. So child care support was certainly an issue. And that also came up in, in Kiri's, Kiri's work. One of the constraints to actually participation on, on these boards were all the demands that women had on their, their time anyway and sitting on a co-management board was just one more thing that had to you know, be on the schedule and they just couldn't accommodate. Yeah. Thank you. 
Well, I think we should probably stop there and uh, take a short break. Yep. Ten minutes. Ten minutes.